comments and questions in the chat box. And um, if you would like to use the microphone later on to ask your question, you could also use the raise hand button and we can call on you so that you can um, be part of the discussion using the microphone. Okay, so uh, without further ado, I'm very excited to introduce our guests tonight or today, again, uh, for some people it's still the afternoon or the morning. Um, our, our session is called Fabulous Powers, Writing the Unreal, Creating Reality by none other than Justina Robson, best-selling sci-fi author. Um, Justina is a novelist from Leeds, England, and is the author of 11 published science fiction novels and many short stories. She was the winner of the 2000 Amazon Writers' Bursary for her first two novels, which explored AI and human engineering respectively. Her third novel, Loop Towards the Far Future, set in a transhuman solar system of political upheaval and personal change as humans encounter their first post-singularity aliens. After that, her stories branch out towards the metaphysical and esoteric within that same universe in the most philosophical of her science fiction books, Living Next Door to the God of Love which is one of my favorites, by the way. After that, she took a sharp left turn into a series, Quantum Gravity, which, while different in tone, continued playing with cyberpunk and bodily augmentations alongside the mystical and magical incursions of other kinds of realities into the human contemporary world. She has most recently written about further human engineering in the female-centric world of The Raft, featured in the novel Glorious Angels, and in the corporatized far future where people switch themselves, where people themselves are commodities of an entirely cynically constructed environment in the switch. In addition to her original works, she has also written The Covenant of Primus, the Hasbro authorized history and Bible of the Transformers. Her short stories range widely, often featuring people and machines who aren't exactly what they seem. Um, Justina Robson, it is a great honor to have you with us today. I'm sure there's so much that you want to say. Um, and the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Rula. Hi, everyone. Um, I can't see you, but I'm going to say nice to see you because that's what I say. Um, in my talk today, as I was writing it, I did have so many thoughts about things I wanted to say, and I piled them and piled them and piled them into this document, which was enormous. So I tried to cull it back and condense it down, especially because it's Sunday afternoon. And um, so what I'm going to do now is uh, I'm going to partly read and partly talk from my condensed thoughts on this subject, and I hope you find it interesting. So my plan was to talk about science fiction and fantasy as modes of writing. I want to say that their scope to allow the imagination as unlimited range, total free access to absolutely anything is unique in the opportunity of literature. And this makes it so important because when other people, especially young people like I was, when I'm reading at radically different places, people, possibilities, um, their minds, as I felt my mind, expand and grow and become capable of greater complexity. So I really felt like I was being uplifted when I started to really get into read science fiction and fantasy myself. And by uplift, I mean that my capacity was expanded, not just about the way that I could think about things, but the whole, the way that I looked at the material world and human beings it just got bigger and bigger and bigger. And the possibilities for a fun and adventure seemed to be so enormous. I was thrilled and excited. I love that feeling. And um, I've always tried to follow it in my reading and writing. And it's been a fantastic journey. Um, I hope lots of other people are taking it too. Um, so it's my personal evolution is something that happened as a result of this. So when I was writing it myself, I was hoping that some of the things that I would write would help other people perhaps uh, find the same kind of fun and interest. Um, but that's all the good moments. Um, we have also, as humans, had many awful moments, um, sometimes related to science, sometimes related to politics, sometimes related to how we organize our lives. And science fiction is really good at exploring that as well, if you've got the 
the guts to go through a traumatic kind of book. I don't always read them that much now because I think like a lot of people, we've been going through an awful lot lately, which is quite taxing to do with the pandemic and uh, a lot of political upheavals. So I have to choose carefully the moments when I've got enough energy to read a really taxing book, but um, they're still really worthwhile when they're, when they're done well. So I, my eyes were open to the size of the universe. And also when that happened, and I sort of gained this cosmic moment, um, I realized I was a very tiny, short-lived thing in that. And I, I got this desperate desire to find out everything that I could before I had to go. Uh, so, um, I became an avid reader and an avid writer. And I used to write with my friends. We used to sit around in group circles and have pads of paper. And we'd all write a story and pass it on. So we'd like have a paragraph and pass it on. We ended up with some weird stuff. And I think that's where I learned to mash everything together, uh, which I have done in my adult work. And some people don't like that because they're a bit more, they like things nicely ordered, but I don't, I like to mix it all up together. Um, one of the things I was doing as I started that process, especially later when I decided I was going to be a proper writer and sit down and write things seriously, was I thought that I had to be part of the vanguard of people who were in the Star Trek kind of manner progressing forwards for humans, thinking and um, organizing ourselves so that we could behave better and do better and it was all a big improvement, all a big self-improvement thing. And I only realized the other day, someone was talking about being Generation X and they said, oh my God, I'm so exhausted from all the self-improvement. And I was like, oh, is that a generational thing then? And I thought, maybe it is actually. I don't know how other generations feel about it, but um, it, it, there's a definite track of, we must progress, we must perfect, we must go on, um, that was driving me all the way through. So I was like, uh, setting myself all the time these big big tasks intellectual tasks of let's solve the problems of humanity and put it in a story it sounds really cheesy which is why I'm saying it that way but that's kind of how I feel about it I still feel a little bit like that but not as much as I used to when I was younger to me all these things they were like a puzzle that you could solve and it's only lately as I might say later that I realized looking at humanity and the way that we operate as a problem is a problem. Looking at us in a way that says we have to be fixed is perhaps not really the best way to go about it because who wants to be criticized all the time? Does that really improve anyone? Don't really think so. So there must be another way to go. So in my later writings, I've tried to be a little bit more, less aspirational and critical, let's say, and more embracing of things. Um, I was brought up in a particular religion, Christianity, um, and a particular education, Western education, a grammar school, and uh, this developmental path, I can never let it go. I've tried so hard uh, philosophically to move on from it, but uh, I don't know if I ever will. And I was thinking, is that a good thing? Should I be letting it go and relaxing into the flow, or should we all be pressing forward to do our best? I think pressing forward to do our best is pretty good actually so I'm going to stick with it um I've been using my fiction and observation over the years to see what's really happening in different circumstances and even though I'm writing a lot of the time about extreme changes for humanity such as becoming half machine or um living on distant worlds with completely different conditions or in circumstances where biologically you've been altered so that things which seem to be completely second nature are different. I've been exploring them for the sake of trying to see further and do more. And I do not even know what it is that I am looking for. Um, and I don't think I ever will. But I have discovered that I think that humanity as a whole has this longing to go beyond, to go beyond yourself, to reach beyond its limits and its boundaries. And at the same time, we know, really know that we are short lived and we know that we are 
part of something that's been going on for so long before us and hopefully will continue for so long after us. That is such a weird situation to be in and so fantastic to write about. So that's what I've been trying to do. So in the pushing radical ideas around fun game, I think that science fiction is uniquely successful there. Um, and loads of people write it so well because it dramatizes these things and makes it lived like my lived experience, which I'm trying to talk about, trying to make that feel real so somebody else can share it is, uh, is the most fun thing about writing. Um, recently, I read a fantastic example of this sort of thing. There's a writer called Adrian Tchaikovsky who has written two novellas, which are in a series called The Dogs of War. Dogs of War is the first one and Bearhead is the second one. Bear as in Teddy the bear or the animal, not. Yeah. Um, those two together, which they feature transhuman characters um, and the way that they are being used and exploited to progress humanity's visions, but also at her, not just they're going to the moon and colonizing it on one, but they're also being used as um, an unwitting army in another one to control um, populations by restrictive governments. And the characters in the first book, Dogs of War, uh, are all, they call themselves by animal names and they have very restricted consciousness to start with. But when there has been a mistake made in one of their uh, creations and the bear in particular is extremely intelligent and extremely connected. And it's a wonderful story about how they figure out who they are, what they are, and how they've been deployed, and then how they try to take some kind of independence back. And um, those are just two wonderful books. So if you do get the chance to read them, do. I was trying similar things when I wrote a book called Natural History um, and the books of the forged universe, which are all about human beings, instead of trying to go to the stars in giant tin cans and take all our biosphere with us and recreate it when we get there, and um, you, you instead, Humanity remakes itself so that there are people who are spaceships and vehicles and satellites and all kinds of things. But, um, but they are biologically and mechanically engineered so that they not just can do those things and go to those places, but can love being in those things and going to those places and live full and expressive lives. And that was my... <laughs> my whole goal with that. Um, so I'm at heart, I, I'm always thinking and dreaming about, about these things. Um, and as well as fiction art, there was a period when I used to write uh, reviews and criticism of books. Uh, at school, I, I was very wary of doing this because whenever I had to write a, a literary report, I always ended up writing things where to get crossed out and teacher would go, no, no, and I, I got so frustrated and I started to think maybe I'm reading wrong. Maybe I can't understand people in books. And um, so I shied away from it very much because I didn't come out with the exam answers that I was supposed to come out with. And um, this nervousness uh, start, made me start to really take things apart in a very intense way, which wasn't actually very good for me, but I did it. And then when I was starting to be a writer, one of the ways that you can sort of get, you know, get in with the, with the social world of writers and readers is to start to review books and to do that kind of thing. This is all pre-blog, pre-internet even, in printed magazines. Um, I, I had these books to review and uh, I got sent some science fiction books, which were meant to be, they were apparently very funny. They were comedy, they were kind of, um, they were a, a very dramatic, pulpy, Mickey take of, it's basically like Austin Powers, which came slightly later, but it was an Austin Powers style, daring do sort of. And I didn't realize that's what they were. I thought for some reason, the packaging, the marketing, the way it made them look, I thought they were genuinely science fiction -y, detective thriller start things. So because I wasn't really primed to read them as funny from the get go, the humor really fell flat on me. And I, I, I wrote this damning review in which I said, oh, I don't get, I, I didn't like this. It thinks it's funny, but it's not funny. Um, and unfortunately for me later, 
I met the editor of that book at a convention two weeks later. He was furious with me, furious. He said, you wrote that review. You killed my series. I was like, oh. Uh, my first reaction to that was, oh my God, um, uh, I've made that mistake again. And the second reaction was, how can I, an absolute nobody from nowhere who wrote a column in a magazine this long, a magazine that hardly anybody reads, have killed this book series. I just, I couldn't believe it. I was absolutely devastated. And um, from then on, I, I kind of, I occasionally wrote reviews and I made another gaffe in a much bigger arena later, which I will relate only for the humiliation so you can enjoy it. Um, the Guardian asked me to review Ian Banks' book. Um, which one was it? I can't remember now. <laughs> Uh, a, a major launch for him, one of the last science fiction books he wrote, and they gave me a whole page to review it in. And I wrote back, I was a massive fan, and I wrote this review, I absolutely loved his book. So I said everything I could say about it. And the editor sent me a note back saying, do you have nothing critical to say about this story at all? And I thought, oh no, I'm not doing my job. I must find something negative to say about it. So I racked my brains, and I racked my brains, and I thought, well, it does go on a bit in places. So. I, I, saw, I wrote a note inside it, which I thought was buried in this wall of text about how fabulous it was saying, I think possibly, you know, the editor might have just cut it down a bit in places or something like that. It was too long. And of course, what happened to me a few weeks later, I met the editor who was not happy. And I basically got the, you'll never eat lunch in this town again treatment. So that was the end of it for me. Um, I started to, I became very self-conscious uh, as a writer and a reader, but particularly as a writer about how, if I wrote more reviews, what more damage was I going to do when I didn't intend to do any? Um, so that's why I don't write criticism, but I think a lot about everything that I read and I really love being part of the community and I feel that there is a kind of a general zeitgeist tide of, of technology and science fiction things going on all the time and I do feel part of that so what I'm saying here uh, are some of the things which I was thinking about which I've never ever said over the years because of that. Uh, some of the more recent books that I was writing as I was trying to craft these wonderful transformational stories, uh, started to get into difficult areas for me where I felt really uncomfortable. And that's in writing about politics, power and sex, sex as in gender, but also as in the physical um, tides, let's call it, which, which flow through us all and which cause us to behave sometimes in ways which we'll just call less than desirable. Um, and in, in Glorious Angels and The Switch, this is kind of where those books went. And I started to get really uncomfortable, kind of anticipating the reviews I might get, knowing the reviews that I'd given. Um, and, but also I, I realized after a couple of test reads, how important it is to get a reader who gets you and how easy it is to miss readers. Uh, and you don't know, you can never know who is gonna pick it up and read it. And you don't know what their secret history is of their whole life that they brought to that moment and their experiences. And, and somehow when I'm writing about very difficult subjects, I try so hard now more than I used to, to nail down exactly all the emotional beats and meanings of what is happening, to try to leave less room for interpretation, which is a bit, a bit weak in creative terms because it's in the gaps where people can come into it and fill it in, which, which really helps to connect. But, um, but I started to get very cautious about that. And this is why I'm writing so slowly at the moment because I, I don't know, I've kind of reached a pit of self doubt, I suppose, about those things. And my, my main concern is that as a writer, I want to provide essentially positive experiences, even if we have to read about things which are awful and difficult sometimes as part of the story. And I'm really worried that I'm, I'm, I'm just not going to do that. But uh, I'm thought I'd say that just because it seems to be part and parcel of going along with thinking about everything um, a great deal and becoming conscious of creating specific things. 
um, that I take the reader more into account than I used to, even though that's an impossible task. Uh, but the reason I put in the, in the advert for this uh, talk that the reader is the medium is because I feel that um, reading is such a creative act and no book can exist if somebody isn't reading it. It exists as you're reading it in your mind, you, you're making it happen. Um, yes, the written words are doing what they do to try to create this thing, but really the reader is the person who's going along with it all and giving permission. And uh, that sense of communion, I guess, uh, communication, when people write to you very occasionally as they do and say, I loved your book and I really got it and they did really get it, is the most amazing thing that ever, ever happens. So, and that's kind of why I'm doing it. And it reminded me, as I was thinking about that, of, of the days when I used to do the round robin, pass the parcel with your friends, write the story. That's what that was about too. It was about joining in with people in a shared story just like the experience of going to the cinema and watching a story together that everybody really enjoys. So there's this big social aspect to it, which I'd never considered until recently, um, which feels now to be, to be more and more important. The more that time passes, that aspect of what's happening um, with writing feels more and more important rather than just being, you know, the lone person who's expressing the big idea. And then it's like the authors out there on their own some kind of hero creature or a terrible creature, depending on what they're making. Huh. One of the things I was writing about um, in, in the last book that I published, which is The Switch, is genetic engineering. And I saw a post the other day um, where someone was there on Twitter uh, promoting an article talking about eugenics which is one of those things that seem to we still haven't really ever allowed ourselves to talk about properly ever since the war uh, and all of the things. Um, and I think that this conversation is something that really goes on in a subterranean way. And it's one of those moments where still, unless it comes up into the public consciousness a bit more to the level where people can calmly discuss it, there's not going to be a lot of progress. I was talking to Rula just before about how uneasy it is to think about taking a vaccine which has been genetically engineered as opposed to a vaccine which is made in the old style by doing things with animals and however they used to do it because you were used to that idea and you're not used to this one. And it doesn't feel safe in the same way and it doesn't feel reliable. And that whole, the newness and the massive accelerated pace of scientific change is, it feels like this constant pressure wave that's going on and on, but comes kind of silently because uh, the general public just doesn't know the half of what's happening in the scientific and technological world. And then you've got your Bill Gates and your Elon Musk at the front of it who look like they're like the figureheads at the front of the whole show, but really, they're actually kind of old hat, to be honest, for a lot of people. They're doing interesting things, but it's very, very low on the scale of change and possibility that's really happening in science. And um, I'm always looking for books and stories that are on the cutting edge of uh, what's happening. I'm trying to be there myself, but I feel, oh, sometimes I feel like, oh no, I'm turning into the old dog that can't keep up with the pack because it's so intense and so exciting. <sighs> and to cap it all off, just to sort of bring all that together, a few months ago, I was asked by someone to write a story for an anthology. And the brief is that we are to write stories in the style of Kim Stanley Robinson's Mars trilogy. Um, now, in the style of means, the Mars trilogy are books about the humans going to Mars, colonizing it, terraforming it, and creating a new world over there. And they're written at great length um, with an enormous attention to detail, scientific accuracy, technological verifiability, everything plausible, nothing too far-fetched, current conditions, 
uh, of course, things have to work out quite well with the technology or it wouldn't happen. But and it's also a novel about social progress and political ideas coming and clashing together and how we're going to build this new world. And will it be the same as the old world or how is it going to happen? So a massive brief uh, in a short story. But my story is supposed to tell of how the human race has got from the position it is in today with climate change and whatever's going on to a future, which is much better by June. So I've got to save the world by June, which is great. Really easy. Here's hoping. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, well, <laughs> I'll, I'll do my old trick of getting to grips with this in the way I know best by thinking about it a lot. Um, and I thought, the, some really interesting stuff in there is the, the story of how we got here is the story of humans bumbling along, getting into stuff, making and doing, creating a huge mess, not really paying attention, only noticing when it's too late, then we have to clean up, but we can't. And um, once again, it's the same kind of story that used to bug me when I was a kid. And I used to ask my parents if I saw on the news something terrible that had gone on in the world, I'd say, why are these terrible things happening? Why can't people not do that? And then they would always have to say something like, well, it's complicated. You'll understand when you grow up. And I am grown up and I still don't quite get it. I've got to say, I mean, I get it in the sense that I can see what's happening, um, but I don't get it as in, why are we still doing this? Because it doesn't seem very smart. Um, and I had lived with this dream that we would all smarten up. And by the time I was the age I am now, it would all be sorted out. And here I am writing a story about how we might sort it out. And I don't know because no one's done it. And it seems to me that if they haven't done it, it must be a bit difficult. Uh, so there is also in there, I have a bit of unease about the humanity is the plucky hero that pulls itself up by its bootstrap story because we keep doing that and it keeps not working. So I was looking backwards and saying, what is it about human beings that keeps creating this situation? Because if you're going to solve it, that's what you've got to solve people again. Here we are solving people again. Um, and it, it, it's your sense that people's sense of identity is really coming under threat and clashing is what's causing the whole situation. How do you smooth that out? So. I have no idea. And I wrote a story years ago called Mappa Mundi, which was a novel, a thriller, about a technology in which it was a nanotechnology spread by a pandemic virus, which took control of people and installed an operating system inside them, which could be then programmed by whoever wanted to program it. So it was almost exactly like the conspiracy theory going around about Bill Gates's microchip, except this worked and it was nowhere near as dumb as that. Um, <laughs> uh, and it happened and the race was, who was gonna get control of it first? Because once you've changed somebody's mind, then the deal's done, right? And I was thinking about this technology. I worked so hard on trying to figure out how that would work in a scientific way. I read the journals and did all this stuff. And I happened to be invited to a conference about artificial intelligence, just as a kind of observer person. And um, I, as I was there, I met some neurologists and neuroscientists who were at the top of there. They were working in Cambridge and uh, we got chatting about this. And one of them, guys who was the oldest professor there sat back in his chair and said yes I can kind of see how you would do that now and I was like oh great awesome fantastic that's such good news <laughs> it's not good news it's not good news at all I said would it would it sort of work like if you change because people's feelings come out of their thoughts it's the thoughts first and then their feelings but the feelings are what really cement it isn't it you kind of have to get them all going and he said yeah that's exactly Exactly, you just have to. Anyway, so that was a really, well, I, I kind of felt really happy, happy that I'd done the research and, and that it was plausible, but really sad because it made me think, 
You know what, though? Even without all of that technology, so much of my life really has been the lab rat round the maze. Because it's only as I got older, I started to see how much of my own behaviour was driven by biology and also driven by um, preloaded things from parents and culture that I had got before I was conscious, really, of getting anything. Um, and I feel uneasy about that, but also how would you ever abandon it? What would you be if you abandoned it all? I don't know. So in my Mundi story, of course, the bad guys get hold of the technology and they're the Americans in this story. And they duly go about their business of trying to make everyone in the world a solid upstanding American citizen. Because it felt to me that that was kind of the dream they were pushing. So I thought, what will happen if they actually get there? Uh, so uh, that was my story. And there are some good people uh, who are being transformed by the technology into strange quasi godlike beings who may not be actually any better as, as rulers, but at least they were interfering with that plan. Um, and lately, as I think about the whole, because all of the technology I've used in my stories has been mental engineering, physical engineering stories. Uh, and at the same time, this is sort of surreptitiously going on in, in agriculture and uh, in medicine and in research in places. It's, it's the strangest feeling and the most uneasy feeling, just like writing about artificial intelligence, which is now the hot topic and has been for the last 10 years. But really it was a hot topic in Nerdsville for like 15 years before that because it typically starts off with the geekery and then only comes up to the mainstream much later. And during that hot topic phase, when Elon and, and all the big thinkers were getting quite um, concerned about it, um, I was really intrigued by the fact, and even now people seem very frightened about it as if it's going to become some kind of God that judges them. Uh, when the AI becomes super intelligent, it's, in it's, its quality of its intelligence, whatever that really means, is somehow going to make it turn against its inventors. Uh, I've, had, I've seen a lot of people give talks about that particular story. Uh, I want to say Kazuo Ishiguro, I know he's written a book about it lately, but actually it's not him, it's Michio Kaku who's talked about it years ago, and Stephen Hawking more recently, and Elon Musk more recently, in terms of the big names. And then before that, the philosophers, Dan Dennett and people, and John Gray have mentioned it before. Um, but you would really have to build a replica human for an AI to have any, any hope of understanding what humans were even doing, I think. And uh, for me, the most interesting aspect of that is how we don't see, it's just gonna sound stupid how we don't see what we don't see. We don't notice ourselves, things which are not interesting to humanity. We don't notice until we have to, features of the natural world, the oceans, the animals, the life, the trees, the climate, until it impinges upon us so directly that we can't ignore it anymore. There's just no natural noticing of what's going on. We haven't learned to talk to cats. We haven't learned to talk to cows. We haven't learned to talk to gorillas, but some of them have learned to talk to us. I mean, who's the dumb one? Humans don't see what, our range of vision is so limited. And um, on the AI business, I think we're kind of doomed to build replicas of the living world. And in that sense, it's that progress as we try to build these things through which we discover that we're not doing a good job and then we feel guilty and then we assume that this thing will be much better because it won't be dogged by all our issues and that it's bound to come and, and judge us badly because we do already that's kind of where we are the real trouble with AI is that you will build one that will sort you out not in a good way I wrote a story about that because it really preyed on my mind called Paper Hearts, which is a novella um, about where an AI takes over the world. Kind of like an admin official, it just does all the office work for everything, for everybody. It deals with all the money and all the trades 
and it sorts everybody out. And that was my dream, but it was very much a pipe dream. Um, and I long for those kinds of things, but I don't think they're terribly realistic. Unfortunately, I think an AI really could sort it out, but would people allow it to do that? No. So I'm going to stop there because I've babbled on for a long time now. And uh, if people have questions or would like to talk, please do. That was wonderful, Justina. I mean, <laughs> such a stimulating talk, just like your novels. You make us think a lot about things. Uh, the first thing that came to my mind right now is that Bill Gates probably is now controlling us all. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> After the vaccine. <laughs> yeah, just kidding. Um, it's just, it's fascinating how we tend to tie science, especially the new science, with conspiracy, the way that we we kind of tie, uh, you know how they say what is fiction today is fact tomorrow. So, and and you know, due to this apocalyptic setting that we've all been in for for about a year and a half, uh, we're kind of living this, you know, the science fictionality of of the world that we are in. So, uh, do you think this has an effect on conspiracy? So, do you think this is where the conspiracy theories are coming from? Are they coming from our minds that are built to kind of interpret or be influenced by science fiction? Or they tend to reject what is new and, um, you know, doubt it in a way. I think there is a, um, a tendency, probably a quite sensible tendency to view everything completely new and demanding as, as suspicious, especially uh -huh. You live in a group of people who are not habitually exposed to that that area of life, whatever it is, um, and it's really tempting to say, "Of course, you should, you know, um, listen to the scientists and do as they say." And all, but we all know there have been times when that wasn't a good idea, yeah. and therefore you can have to expect quite a lot of a long lead-up time to anything becoming an accepted idea. Um, it's quite sensible, even at times when it seems like it's really getting in the way, but the conspiracy theory and the conspiracy theory appeals to the same parts that I think, uh, which are appealed to by religion, anything that offers you a sense of strong community and purpose and certainty, because everything is so uncertain and it isn't sure that humanity has no purpose. <laughs> and things are not certain and the stuff we don't know is nearly everything so yeah right. I get that some people feel it more than others that's all <laughs> right. yeah. and do you think that what is fiction can become fact like for example there are so many things that were envisioned by um cartoons like the Jetsons you know and um things like you know in, in science fiction, how, you know, the pandemic occurs. And of course, I mean, there are lots of things that didn't happen yet, but we kind of see that, um, you know, there's this prophetic aspect to writing science fiction. Do you agree? I mean, we yeah. have this uh, our, uh, ele electronic map at home that we, we called Rosa ever since we bought it because it reminded us of, of Rosa and the Jetsons. And we were like, you know, now we use Zoom. That's what they used to do a long time ago. When we used to watch it as kids, we would wonder when this would happen, when we could see the person that we are calling. And it actually did happen. And, it did. and so many other things. I think everything is happening kind of like that. First, people have to imagine it. Then they have to dream it. Then somebody who is little, who doesn't know how impossible it is, grows up and makes it. And that's very much how it goes on. Um, you're talking about the Jetsons. The aesthetic of the Jetsons was in design all over the place. It, it's what the future looks like. The future looks like either the future looks shiny and glossy like the Jetsons, or it looks like Blade Runner and it's a complete dump. But we know that's the future. Cyberpunk, the game, when it came out, is that particular kind of future. And it's not really about the future. It's about a feeling, a style, a time. It's very strange, but it because people learn that that's what the future was then yes they make it in a store and you can do that very consciously or also very unconsciously it's like you get up there and you think yes i recognize this this is how it's meant to be because you saw it or read it and yeah I do. it's amazing how much fact there is in fiction right 
Oh, I've got a flood of questions here for you and comments. Okay. So uh, we have, right. Diana, Diana's Beef asks, may you please repeat the name of the story you wrote related to AI? Oh, there are many. Oh, that's Silver Spring. Silver, Silver Spring is the novel. All right, thank you. And there is AI in Paper Hearts as well. And uh, Hedi Habra uh, says, thanks so much for these wonderful insights. Miriam Sete says, you've talked of some boundaries you have crossed as a science fiction writer in the pursuit of your fiction. What boundaries are you afraid to cross? I am afraid to cross the kind of boundaries where Let's see. I want to say I'm not afraid, but that's probably a lie. So I'm trying to trying to honestly figure it out. Um, I'm afraid to cross into spaces where, for example, people, I might reveal to myself things, however tangentially true, which suggests that there's no hope mm -hmm. for this change. There's no way out. There's no progress. There's only repetition and copying and this relentless churn of the same thing. I would hate for that to be convincing. Yeah. <laughs> Something like that. I guess we would all feel the same way about it. Yeah, well, hopefully. <laughs> but that would be horrible because it would mean everything was meaningless mm -hmm. in a way that human beings just can't it's just intolerable really however vain it is to think that the things that you think of have meaning you still kind of have to mm -hmm. play the game <laughs> yeah. yeah uh we have a question we have a comment ahmad sharafuddin says thank you for these enjoyable ideas you just shared with us um Hedi Habra also says, Jules Verne comes to mind in terms of anticipating discovery. Mm. And Alan Hickman asks, who are your influences? I haven't read much sci-fi in recent years, but I'm interested. I used to love John Windham's apocalyptic novels and Fred Saberhagen, for instance. Oh, yes. I used to read John Windham a lot when I was uh, a teenager. Oh, I loved his stuff. Who are my influences? In fantasy, I would say Robert Holdstock um, and his book, Lavandus, uh, was a major influence because that really was one of the points where I, I saw someone take story apart for the first time in a story about stories. And that was amazing. Um, Toni Morrison, uh, I read her, I read Sula when I think I was about 20 and it just blew my mind because I did not know, isn't it? I didn't know you could write about those things. Of course you can write about anything. Nobody wrote about things like she wrote about them. And I, I mean, emotional, personal, in the moment, shocking things. Uh, her books are just on a human level, mind blowing. Uh, that really altered. Mm -hmm. um, who else? Ian Banks, the science fiction was my favorite um, because he combined so many different factors all in one thing. That he was funny, he had high technology, massive space opera, um, all kinds of bangs and crashes and whistles and wars and amazing stuff going on. And his characters were funny and dry and witty. And, but they're also quite, I understand, uh, they're quite British especially Scottish because he was Scottish and maybe they don't travel that well but I'm English so they travel pretty well for me. Uh, I loved his work um, and Octavia Butler who wrote uh, an amazing set of books which were the first time I'd seen science fiction writers really getting into I suppose more um, more feminine, uh, feminine, I don't like saying that word, but it is a more feminine take on science and technology, deeply rooted in 
personal experience and biological transformation and they were wonderful. Um, oh, and Shirley Jackson, oh, yeah. who wrote a lot of ghost stories. Uh, she's been yeah, made into lots of TV lately, but uh, um, as, a, as a writer, she was amazing. Um, uh, and James Tr Tree Jr., who was Alice Sheldon in real life, um, who was one of the greatest short story writers in science fiction. And I'm sure there's loads more and I could just go on and on, but I won't. <laughs> okay. So that was an impressive list. <laughs> um, we have a question from Nandi. Nandi says, this was literally amazing. Uh, something very new for me and very enriching. I enjoyed how I noticed how much we need to widen our thoughts and I also really enjoyed hearing about your experience. I was wondering what helps to spark motivation for you to write when it gets low sometimes? Oh, good question. Hmm. I know it's like going to the gym and doing lots of other things. Starting is really hard, but I know that if I start, I will enjoy myself and I will find something to enjoy and to get along with. And I will feel afterwards a sense of progress. So yeah, I've just got to remember that and get started. So as long as I can get over that initial hurdle and I find if I'm struggling with that, the best thing to do is read some books on how to write. I've got a lot of books, they're not all good. Some of them are awful. But if I just read books or articles about writing, I start to want to write. So I do that. That's a great tip, actually. <laughs> um, another question by Ani Jamil. Ani asks, you mentioned earlier that you love to review on others' work and they didn't take it too kindly. Would you be upset if someone left a bad review on one of your writings? Well, they have. So, <laughs> yes, yes, I would. Um, Usually, uh, yeah, you don't forget them very easily. Um, I think um, if it's a sensible comment, if it's a genuine a comment from someone who has obviously read it and uh, has a, some beef with it, either the subject is different. It depends if it's the subject or if it's about me, if it feels it's more personal. If it's about the subject or something, well, that's just how it is. We've got different views. But if it's, it feels more it's like, oh, I hated this book. It was so full of rubbish and whatever it says. Well, people have said um, about Silver Screen in the past, somebody did say that they thought uh, it was as a bit, um, it has a character in it who is uh, Anglo-Indian, but I'm not an Anglo-Indian. And uh, I don't write about issues to do with that community, even though the character's from there and they thought that I should have and that I shouldn't have written it like that. Those things are really, yeah, make me stop and think. And I have to, I have to really think if they've got a good point or not. And it's hard to take if they have. <laughs> so yes, it does hurt. But it's all right. <laughs> and we have a question. Uh, Dr. Lulu Malab has her hand up. So I guess Lulu, you would want to take the mic. Yeah, hello. Can you hear me? I can. Yeah. Uh, hi, how are you? Hi. Uh, I'm very happy to be here. Uh, to Lulu, can you remove the earphones? Or, yeah, yeah I, I thought so. This is why I asked you are hearing me. Yeah, so I'm, I'm very happy and excited to, I was very happy and excited to be here with you today because I, I have like, a, a, I, I wanted to benefit from your experience because as Rula knows, I have a, a, a sci-fi book now uh, out for publication. Okay. It's, still, it's still not, uh, I'm still... Uh, sending it out uh i have like i mean two questions i'll ask the first one and then i'll leave the floor for others and if there's more time i'll ask the second one my first question is the following uh so do you believe that um uh, in in my in my uh in my novel i speak of a society of futuristic society where ai takes over and they create this great computer system that takes ev over everything so people can never do the wrong thing so they're always doing the right thing blah 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 so but uh, the end of the book is where the humans preferred to destroy this and go back to the state of nature over living in this equality and senselessness so the main theme was that a human being is a human being no matter what what you try to change in him our desires are our desires what's your take on this i mean 
do you find it? Yes, <laughs> I would say. Um, yes, you're writing about something which is really primal to uh, this moment where technology does have this potential, it seems, to outdo us at our own game of trying to be good or do right. Uh, yeah, that's a fascinating thing. I would love to see that story because um, no matter how you decide to, to turn it, um, I think that the premise you state there is, is probably true to the degree that in order to escape that, if, if, if that fate seems a bit grim, the only solution seems to be that everyone has to become very consciously aware to the point where they're free of it but you're never really free of it. I mean, you can't, it, you can only consciously intervene on yourself, I suppose, is, is the only solution, isn't it? And, and you've got your AI who's doing it for the people, for good or ill, and then they don't want it. And I think that not wanting it thing, just like we were talking about the uh, not liking the new technology, the not want, I don't want it interfering with me. It's so, it's, you know, it's, totally the human thing so yeah i think the spot on yeah but maybe i yeah even if they reached a place where they were living in a state of heaven like nobody can harm anybody like every they, they don't work they just do whatever they're passionate about and still they they wanted to just they wanted the competitive life they wanted the hard work they wanted to uh, sweat basically huh. and well you're built for that we are made to do that mm. Yeah, it seems completely, totally, Thank you. totally believable, yes. Okay, uh, thank you, Dudu. Do we have, I believe we have two, three more questions here. Uh, Lorenzo Caligaris. Lorenzo says, you mentioned that you've become less harsh on humanity as you went on writing science fiction. Has your view on AI changed similarly? Was there ever a point in which you thought that an overlord AI was going to judge as, us as harshly as you were? Oh. Maybe in the early years, I think when I first came across the ideas of AI and people had sold it as, um, as this, the danger, obviously since the 50s, since the 30s, since earlier, that whole idea of the machines taking over has very much been the you know, um, sorting out your troubles because you're so difficult. It's a, a story that occurs over and over. Yes, I suppose to begin with. And then I started to think, but why would it bother? <laughs> I mean, why would it care? I don't know. So that, I suppose it started from that aspect. Do I, yes, humans judge themselves very harshly all the time. And I think, uh, yes, it, it, part of that competitive nature, um, the judgment goes with the competition, doesn't it? Otherwise, how will you know who is the best? You will not know. So that, trying to balance all of these drives that we have, which can work for or against you, very difficult. That's why I'm more forgiving, because I never managed to do it. <laughs> I feel it's really hard. <laughs> and when I was young, I didn't know how hard it was going to be. But now I do. <laughs> Thank you, Lorenzo, for the question. Uh, we have another question by Ahmed, uh, who asks, I wonder how it comes to your mind that humans would be controlled somehow. How oh, oh, you mean humans? Because <sighs> a lot of people want it. A lot of people, it seems to me, feel very happy if the people Oh, I'm not going to say who they don't like, who they feel inconvenient, are sort of minded elsewhere. People like things, things being their general milieu, their society. People want to feel safe in living their lives in an area that they know. And in order to get that state, they have to control the conditions so they're not constantly challenged. And that includes controlling other people and what they can do and not do. Um, and it involves controlling yourself and what you can do and not do. 
So living together in a social, we are such vicious, violent, competitive, aggressive beings. For us to live together at all in harmony requires a constant art of control on so many levels. That's really, that's why, I think. All right. Um, thank you, Ahmed. We have a question from Mirahan. Mirahan asks, to what extent can science fiction affect or improve the developments in science and technology in human life? Is it right to say that science fiction can change what human life looks like in the future? Um, yes, it's very possible because people, people work by creating an idea and then making it. So if you have people writing science fiction stories where they're making massive ideas, which they're selling to you wholesale as a giant block of ideas, and you like it, then you're going to try and go in that direction. So all the time, I was thinking of Star Trek when you said that, because to me, when I was little and, and to the team, all the way through my life, Star Trek's been there. And it's always had this goal, this very idealistic goal, not only about going to the stars, and but about constantly bettering itself themselves everybody nowadays we've got the more recent storylines start to throw a bit of a darker light don't they on some of the things that happened in in star trek's past and the creation of starfleet academy but i was thinking the other day if you wanted to do something really good for the world build starfleet academy go for it why not i mean it had all the ideals there i don't think everybody shares those ideals it's my illusion that they would because i like them but I don't think everybody does. I don't know. All right. uh, question from Turkey. Turkey asks, do you think it is in human nature to accept or deny such a big change? We love denying things, especially when it doesn't suit us to try and, and adjust our, our behaviors that we've just got sorted out. Um, I think if you're proposing really big changes to people, they have to see some immediate benefit very fast and feel it very strongly or feel it very strongly as an ideology, something that they desperately want to do. Because it is difficult to change your own habits. I mean, even changing a tiny habit in a human being is difficult. And everything that seems out of the ordinary is unsettling. And you can only take so much of it as with the pandemic thing really brought it home to me, how you can only take so much weird and then you have to get away. You have to go backwards, which is that conservative retrenchment feeling all the time. I want to go back to where it was safe. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to very cautiously progress and have very clearly spelled out benefits uh, for it to stick. So it's difficult. All right, thank you, Turkey, for the question. Uh, we have a question from Daniel. Uh, Daniel says, speaking of AI, when do you feel like the border between what is science fiction and what is real starts to fade? The fear of an apparent science fiction event, such as the singularity or a complete AI takeover, is slowly but surely starting to turn into a real thing. Ah, oh, the singularity. That sounds horrible to me. I know lots of people seem to think you're just going to live on like now, but in a machine. I, could, just, no. I would say to anyone who really thinks that you just haven't thought this through about how much of you is physically your body. That's everything, everything you've got, absolutely everything, because without it, there's nothing. <laughs> so you can't replicate it in a machine. Yeah, maybe in the future you can, but even if you did, you get to a point where you have the replicator conundrum, again, like the Star Trek one with the teleport system. If I destroy you here and remake you over there, are you the same? Or did I kill you and just make a new one? Is, is that just a philosophical distinction? Hard to say. So, wow. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Um, Dr. Alan Hickman says, someday we'll all live on a starship and wear pajamas all day. That'd be great. I'd be into that. <laughs> it would be fun, especially if it, it stopped. It, it, we can't just cruise forever in the dark, though. It has to stop off at some really interesting points. And so you can get out and do stuff and then come back on and move for that. That would be good. 
Uh, Miriam, Miriam has her hand up. Miriam Sete, Dr. Miriam Sete. So Miriam would like to take the mic. Yes, thank you. Well, first of all, I really appreciated your brilliant talk. And so you are among the, the women writers who have uh, approached science fiction. You, you are in a good company, I think. So you, um, you have approached science fiction. It seems to me that you have approached science fiction to such extent that it seems appropriate to uh, point out the, the numerous similarities which exist between you and Doris Lessing, for an example. So now we have, there's no time to, <laughs> to um, enlist all these, simi these similarities. So I will focus on what I uh, consider to be the strongest and, the, and most interesting common point of reference between you two. Um, in particular, your, your common distrust of and yet fascination with the workings of memory, you know, as well as the construction of a, a personal sense um, uh, of selfhood, one, yeah. one which develops from, um, um, as, as Rula uh, underlined um, some minutes ago, from an, a mixture of fact and fiction, also no? actuality and a sense of personal truth. Um, it seems to me that you both writers uh, use your self-representational or uh, autobiographical texts as uh, the therapeutic means of uh, self-discovery, no? Yes. Uh, so, so am I right? Do, do you think I'm right? <laughs> yeah, yes, I do think I'm right. It's something uh, which has to do with uh, my words, so. Uh, no, I think you're, you're dead right there. Yes, completely right. That is exactly what's happening. It wasn't intentional to begin with that that's what I was going to do. It's just that in writing and starting to think about memory and how people are put together and how we put ourselves together and how we put our sense of the world together, it, you just automatically do, you know, the only thing you can really work on is yourself because that's the only experience I've got and I'm ever gonna have uh, any insight into. Um, so yes, I, I, and then because I started doing that, I deliberately went on and I did yoga and got yeah. very, yoga and this just all that all that stuff for a long time eastern mysticism and everything i could lay yeah, my yeah. hand just to figure and it out you know that also doris lessing uh, she right. never <laughs> explicitly <laughs> refers to spirituality in her works but she right. nonetheless explores the spiritual issues no throughout her text so yeah so many thanks for your talk for being here today thank you <laughs> Thank you, Miriam. Uh, Lulu, uh, there was another question that you wanted to ask. Actually, it was it was answered. It was answered uh, with others. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, let me see. If Thank you very much. It was very insightful and inspiring. I, I loved every minute. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. And thank you so much, Justina, for this uh, wonderful session. And um, again, there's an interview with Justina on Indelible, on the latest issue of Indelible that came out in January. So you might also want to check this one out. And uh, we greatly look forward to seeing you again in future sessions. And we're all waiting for your next forthcoming novel. So what, do, you, do you know what date it could be uh, released? Or there's no date yet? I don't know. I don't have a date yet. Still so on the I'll, 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 Still working on it. All right. Well, good luck. And, thank you. Uh, thank you so much. And everybody have a wonderful evening. And I'll see you again tomorrow. So good night. Bye-bye. Good night. Bye. Bye. Bye.